Good evening, and welcome to the Menil Collection. My name is David Breslin. I'm the John R. Eckel Jr. Foundation Chief Curator of the Menil Drawing Institute. I'm very happy to welcome back Charles Ray to the Menil. As many of you know, this is the last of three lectures in a series that he has entitled Thoughts on Sculpture. I do, but I turned it off. The first lecture in October was entitled Sculpture with Holes. The second in January was entitled Matisse and Super Clay. Charles is one of the most important artists working today. The Kunstmuseum Basel and the Art Institute of Chicago recently co-organized and hosted his breathtaking exhibition, Charles Ray, Sculpture, 1997 to 2014. His work has been presented at the Whitney Biennial on five different occasions and twice at the Venice Biennale. During a career of making sculpture, Charles also has been writing. Within the last three years, he has written essays and reviews on the work of, among others, John Chamberlain, Chris Burden, Anthony Caro, and David Smith. I won't belabor this introduction. We know who we're here to see, and we'll miss him when he's no longer giving these lectures. But I want to thank Charles for the incredible effort and kindness he's extended to all of us who have had the pleasure to hear him speak. Of course, I want to thank him for his generosity, but also for the privilege of letting us experience his thinking in action. You've transformed this foyer from a place we're accustomed to be accustomed to being presented to into a space, part seminar room, part lab, part studio, where knowledge is actually being produced. But we would not expect anything else. In one of the texts that he prepared for the catalog for the Chicago Basel exhibition, Charles wrote, and I quote, with all sculpture, I am interested in where you find yourself in relationship to the object. If the object can move you physically from one position one space to another, it will also move you intellectually." End quote. These lectures also have provided us with another set of movements through history, time, dimension, and your thinking. And I assure you that we have been moved. Please join me in welcoming Charles Ray for a lecture he has entitled, Subject Matter as a Formal Element. Thank you, David. Is the mic working now? I wish it wasn't, because then I could stall a little bit more. <laughs> um, yeah, the title of the lecture is Subject Matter as a Formal Element. Um, I'm not sure it's a good title or not. And I think for uh, my career, I've struggled with subject matter. I, I was trained in um, high modernism and, you know, and, and I thought I was an abstract sculpture. But everything I made, if you blew on it, it would tip over and fall on you and kill you. And um, that kind of had a subject matter in itself. Um, as I developed, I moved to Los Angeles and I was um, uh, kind of associated with um, the bad boy school of art, I guess, uh, or so it was, was termed. I was always trying to move away from, the, from subject matter, you know, deny subject matter. So I, I've spent a um, lot of effort and uh, time trying to push the fact that my work, for instance, Oh Charlie, 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 wasn't about an or orgy, a sex orgy, or the big lady wasn't about um, your mother, um, that it was a, the subject was a formal device to bring about some kind of interesting structure or abstraction. And um, maybe it's not true, I'm not sure. And, um, but that's the, that's the nature of um, art, I think. And uh, I've been thinking more and more about um, what maybe is really interesting about making art and looking at art is the dynamic structure of art. And, um, you know, and subject matter, I guess. But with, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to start because I'm stalling, I think. I was going to start with a sculpture that seemingly has a really obvious subject. Uh, it's called a loon girl, and it, it's a figurative sculpture. And uh, it was made about 
almost 20 years ago, I think, and, or at least started about 20 years ago. And um, it's the first sculpture I made that, um, figuratively, that reached, if you will, for, for realism, in a sense. It previously, I had not made bad figurative art, but had made sculptures of mannequins. So I was very interested in the conventions of mannequins. Then I carried that convention of mannequin making into figuration, using body molds and actually using mannequin sculptors and sculptresses as assistants. And mannequin technology and uh, conventions of like how eyes are painted, uh, using real hair and whatnot. Um, this was the first sculpture that kind of moved away from that, you know, for lack of a better word, pop gestalt of, of uh, the, the image. And uh, it began, I knew the model uh, really well, had a, had a relationship with her. Uh, she was once a student of mine and once an, uh, an assistant. And, um, uh, that relationship changed over the period it was made. And I only bring that up as in relationship to the subject. Um, I don't see it as a portrait, and maybe that's uh, what's interesting, is the subject, the person, uh, and also one of the people who worked on it. Um, so is the subject a self-portrait, or am I the subject? of the sculpture. Um, people recently have reviewed it and um, maybe as negative as it gets, they call it creepy. And uh, that might be an aspect of the subject. But you know, let me try to get into it a little bit uh, differently. The dynamic of it began with, I think, how it was made. Um, trying to go in this direction that I was just talking about. So I began with an armature of a body mold. And I hired a guy from uh, Vermont who um, runs a company called Pink, Pink House Studios. And he flew out from Vermont with all his equipment and another assistant, and we made a body mold. And. Um, then from the body mold, we made a plaster uh, positive. And that plaster positive was worked on for a number of years, maybe eight years or so. And a couple things happen. When you make a mold in silicon, it somewhat shrinks. Then when you make it in plaster, it shrinks more. And then when you cast it, eventually in metal, it shrinks even more. And the model was a uh, strong person, but uh, short in size. And then the shrinkage shrunk it even more. So one of the things that has been said is creepy about it is that I made uh, a woman in a diminutive size, in, in a way. And um, I myself happen to think that's one of the most interesting things about it because it brings up an issue of scale, and um, which I'll maybe talk about a little bit more in a minute. But um, smaller size doesn't mean reduced scale. Scale is a sculptural quality that exists here in this space. When you change the scale of an object, it leaves the space and goes into another space. It goes into a half space, a one-fifth space. It goes into almost like a drawing. It goes into kind of like a planned space. Um, she is reduced in size, but never left this space. And that's a quality that I think, when people have referred to it as creepy, is not so much creepy as awkward and difficult to find your relationship to the sculpture. Um, do we call it it or her? And what does the size have to do with it or her is, is I think, an interesting point. Another aspect to the sculpture that I think deals with the size of it 
is when um, it's just fact. When you use material and when you use plaster, it's warm. So if I was to take a body mold of myself, generally when you put plaster in the genital area, um, it seemingly arouses it without getting someone ready for a sexual act. It's just what happens. It's just a, a, a kind of natural reaction to the body. So the clitoris on the sculpture became enlarged or engorged um, through the act of the guy making the sculpture, not through the act of wanting to have sex or something like that, just through a, a reaction. And that has caught different writers' attention and people's attention. What I find powerful about that isn't that I'm leading you into a pornography, but what that does in relationship to the reduced scale, to not scale, excuse me, the reduced, the, it's not a reduced size, it's a size that you have to wrestle with. And I think the, the, also the genitals are bald so the plaster doesn't stick to it. So I, I bring these things up too, because these aren't aspects when you're making a work that you have thought about ahead of time. For me, they're not anyway. They're a dynamic relationship to the making of the work that I hope eventually, and you're not even thinking about this consciously, transfers over and, and to the perception of the work to, to the viewer struggling with what the subject of the work is or what the meaning of the work is. Um, what became the intention and the, the, this kind of dynamicism of the work was what it came from a body mold. When you make a body mold, there's distortion. So, you know, you get a gravitational distortion from the material. And that, those were being taken off. Different other elements of the body were being idealized. Other elements were being left natural. There is a kind of metered matrix of decisions that accumulated over a long period of time with many different uh, assistants and hands working on the sculpture. And I think when you view it and you grapple with it, everywhere you look on it, you find, in a certain sense, a decision. How do you tell their decisions and not just a push for realism? Because each decision isn't, real, isn't about realism. I think the most realistic aspect of the sculpture outside of the overall gestalt of wrestling with it as you would wrestle with a subject of somebody you know. Nobody you know, even the person who's taking your money at Kmart, you have a kind of interaction with, a dynamic with at the checkout counter, with your husband, with your wife, with your enemy. There's a, a dynamic, and by that I mean it's constantly changing and shifting. Um, over the years, the making of this shifted and changed, and what was a struggle with it changed. But I think the most realistic aspect of it is the flat-footedness of it, the pose, the, the space between the hand and the thighs. Seemingly an abstraction, but it's, 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 it's really the most realistic energy of the piece, the space between the arms and the body, the space between the, the two legs. So the subject obviously is a woman, obviously it's a sculpture, and it's the, or is it? Is it the matrix of decisions that went into it? I was trained as a modernist sculptor, and the floor, as Carl said, is not the, what the sculpture sits on. It's the last element of the sculpture itself. Um, with Starting this work, I saw the potentiality of a body, of a, of a figure, as a kind of manifold for sculptural events to unfold upon. 
And I am in a dynamic with myself wondering, am I denying the subject of the work? Or is it as abstract as I like to think it is? I tend to think, and this can change, but the subject of the work is the dynamic of the confrontation with the work. And that, I don't mean that the sculpture is overly aggressive, but you're wrestling with it into the world. How is the peace in the world? And to, for me to think about that, I have to ask myself, how am I in the world? Um, how do I think of myself? How do other people think of me? And this I'm, is uh, from the Green Oldenburg store from the Green Gallery in I think 62 or 61. And I think Oldenburg has a really um, beautiful and fascinating relationship to subject. Because could you say these are about chairs and cakes and ice cream cones? And when you confront the cake, I think you have to laugh. At least I ask myself or I start thinking, not so much what is the nature of subject, but what is the nature of objects and our relationship to it. That is so, boom, just all the cake. It's so there in the room as a piece of cake. But try to eat it. Try to think of the cake you give to your daughter for her second birthday, and then think of that. Uh, to me, the subject isn't obviously the cake or the chair or the ice cream cone or even those objects as fun subjects. But they're really, when you start to, to experience it and give it time, quite scary aspects of reality. That this kind of notion that um, objects aren't in our control or aren't anywhere close, our ability to name them. We can name that a cake and an ice cream cone, but it's so far from a piece of cake and an ice cream cone. It has a very kind of deep philosophical embedment, I believe. Or it's so obviously a toilet. but so structurally away from a toilet. There's a great interest now, and I think Olenberg uh, foreshadows it, but the, 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 the new speculative realism and object-orientated philosophy of like, someone like Grant Harmon, who um, believes objects have an existence outside of our perception of them. And their true reality and nature exists outside of our relationship to them. And what we see as a toilet is in a sense just the tip of a massive iceberg and it is something that the, the nature of what the toilet is, is, or any object is, is something much, much, diff much, much, much different. They're quite frightening in a way. They're, it's, Oldenburg is so beautiful because the, the, 
the, the, the kind of cartoon or the humor or the, the immediate popness and its thereness, um, the subject allows you to slowly form a relationship and, and um, I think get there. What, this is a fan and try to think of a fan in your house on a hot day and then think of this object. I mean, when I put that slide up, everybody's mind, or if you walked into the exhibition and saw that, you go, fan. And now think of a very hot day in the, you know, the summer, and you turn your fan on, and then this object, they have nothing to do with, with each other. And I think what the sculpture is really about is that the fan that you turn on and you're so familiar with has nothing to do with you. So obviously it leaves its subject as fanness and is really about objectness. This is from a, a still from a, a couple of stills from uh, Buster Keaton, uh, Steamboat Bill, or it might be Steamboat Willie. I've seen it called, called both. But I find Olenberg and Keaton incredibly similar, where this kind of philosophical relationship to objects, this is a scene from Steamboat Bill where he's trying on, the, the steamboat captain is trying to get him into a proper hat. He's gonna go to work for him, he shows up for work and, and not this hat, but a hat somewhat like that that's inappropriate for someone working on a steamboat and isn't macho enough or whatnot. So the captain takes him to a hat store and there is a, a beautiful two-minute scene of trying, seemingly trying on hats. But the hats are something else. They, like Oldenburg's toilet, it quickly realize you're not looking at what you, you, you can't identify what you're looking at. I mean, Oldenburg doesn't care about toilets. What he's telling you about the toilet is about your chair, or your loafer, or your glasses. You think you know what this object is, but you have no idea. And the, the, in the, this movie scene, which I could, you can find it on YouTube, is quite beautiful, really, because the, the animation in a way without the hats doing crazy things. The hats just kind of take on an identity away from the people. There's a scene in uh, The Navigator that, that's quite beautiful where Buster Keaton is painting the side of a ship and the waves are, he's on a raft and the waves are moving, and the paint can is sliding on the raft. One wave comes, and it almost slides off. Then another wave comes, it slides back the other way. And always when he puts his hand down, not looking at the bucket of paint, it just, the brush goes in. And he gets the thing without looking. Then he thinks the can's here, and it always ends up there. So it's almost like the can and the paintbrush have a relationship outside of the painter, outside of the human who is, 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 is is working with a, a relationship that's inaccessible to, 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 to the mind or to us. And I, I find Oldenburg's, you know, very much that subject. So Oldenburg's light switches, which I think are so anthropomorphic that they're no longer anthropomorphic. This is uh, obviously, it's a, it's a beautiful piece, it's a sink. Um, I'm gonna read you just a paragraph of the next sculpture that I'm gonna show. And I did a little bit of research and I had one of my assistants go around um, and talk to people who had seen the sculpture that I'm, isn't up yet and try to describe it without giving the, talking about the identity of the object. And I'm just gonna read one 
paragraph out of, out of, out of uh, there, there was many. Uh, what I realize now, it's not like so messy. It's another cylinder fabric object, but the top of the circle is facing us, so we can't see the base. But I s assume for some reason that it's just like the small circles with the metal ornaments. And there's this beautiful kind of iridescent metallic fabric, which also the other ones have around the circle. The top is kind of, what I want to say, flesh-colored. But then it's not flesh-colored. The flesh of a white person, I guess. And there's this kind of softball made out of fabric with three lines through it in the center. Kind of creates this nice indent pressure. And then on top of that are another kind of circular object. But it's more like an umbrella. And there's two of them. And then they have a top point. So they kind of mimic breasts. They're shiny, copper, metallic fabric. But they're loose and deflated like everything else. Like they, they lost their structure. And there's an ornamental kind of metal jewelry on top. There's also this dark burgundy circle tip, which makes me think of the aureola. And then the jewelry is like the nipples. And then there's these two objects in between those two things I described and I recognize as boobs. And the main circle, deflated piece, I don't know what they are. They're like really strange. One is like, it looks like a patent leather or faux patent leather fabric. Everything's made out of fabric in some weird metal or cardboard. And this patent leather thing looks like a rectangle. And there's the sculpture that was just described. And I think it's really a beautiful experiment to stand in front of this if you have the opportunity and call somebody up on your cell phone and explain what you're looking at and not say drum set or drum kit. And I think it tells you something, not about drums, but about the nature of objects and the nature of our perception of objects. And I think that's the genius of Oldenburg. And I think when he gets further in the future and starts making large, hard objects, they lose that quality, that philosophical quality that I think he shares with uh, Buster Keaton. This is a piece by um, Keenholz from the early 60s, I think 64, called uh, Backseat Dodge 38. And it's kind of a notorious sculpture. It was um, censored at uh, LACMA when it was uh, shown, I think, in 68. And um, then allowed to be shown if the door was shut and only an adult could ask a guard to open it. <laughs> and so there's an obvious subject there. There's sex going on in the car. The female figure is made out of plaster. She has panties on. The slip kind of is both inside and outside. There is a, a high heel shoe on the seat or of the car and then the second one is kind of embedded in the male figure who's made out of chicken wire. And in relationship to its subject and to some of the work we, we just looked at, I'd ask to think about <clears throat> where one is in relationship to the viewing of the sculpture. And, um, Keenholz prefers the sculpture in a dark room, uh, preferably painted dark green, um, with illuminated by the headlights and the interior car light and the, the uh, radio on. I found Oldenburg so beautiful because the boundary of the work in its structure, like I said, the fan, the boundary, the, your relationship to the work isn't just your relationship you, to the sculpture. You, you, you turn around and maybe you, 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 you 
don't know what that door is. You don't know. Your, your wallet all of a sudden becomes another kind of strange object when you think about Oldenburg. Um, its embedment in the world is fluid and dynamic. With Keenholz, and I think this is a beautiful piece, so don't get me wrong, but I, as a viewer, always know exactly, exactly where I am in relationship to the sculpture. There isn't a dynamic. And if I get confused by the empty beer bottles, he's also made a base with the AstroTurf. So I know those beer bottles are not in my world, they're in Keenholz's world. Where Oldenburg's relationship to the subject is out here in our world. It's not removed in a frame in a structural aesthetic world. Oldenburg, or Keenholz wants the lights off. He wants the boundary of the art and the aesthetic experience defined. Where Oldenburg is philosophically much more slippery. Perhaps a loon girl is much more awkward in terms of what my life was and then via then how you're going to deal with that sculpture. This is called The Birthday. It was first shown in Germany. You know, obviously the subject is an abortion. Uh, I'm always kind of, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm not criticizing the work. I'm using an example to show, to, to talk about where you are in relationship to the work and to the subject. It has a very powerful and strong subject, but it's a very clear subject. And for me, I told somebody recently, looking at the sculpture does not change my relationship and my ideas about abortion. And I don't think looking at it would change anybody's, really, pro or con. And again, if you're confused about where the sculpture begins and ends, Keynotes will help you with the checkered floor. So we understand where the art is, and where the world is. And so what I'm trying to say is the subject is clearly here. Where in Oldenburg, the subject is, it's hard to identify exactly where it is. This is a beautiful Keenholz piece, and I think begins to break that down. It's called The Weight. You know, he's very uh, Dickens, isn't he? Keenholz. It's like, this is Habersham. But what's beautiful about this piece is he puts a live parakeet in the cage. And I think that kind of breaks that boundary and that border to, 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 to a bit. When I was young and first started in sculpture, when we would slide around metal pieces and then when they were done we would weld them together and paint them red. And the painting of them red or blue, you know, in high modern sculpture helped in a sense do what that rug is doing. Define the border of the, of the piece in a sense, the structure of it. This is H.C. Uh, Westerman's piece. And I show this slide first because of the scale and the change. It's called the change, the change. And what is the change? You know, old, uh, Westerman was an acrobat and a contortionist. Is the change, the change is written on the base. The title of the piece, as they often are in, in his work. And, and I think it's really interesting to question where the subject of uh, Westerman work is and what it is. Is it a knot? Is it the change of material? Is it a figure? Is it a portrait of him in a contortion? Is it craft? 
it's the same piece, but when, when you see it without him, it's hard to gather the, the, the scale of it. I think it's a really complicated mental piece, or most of his work, I, I, I think, is. This is a good example. It's called Imitation Knotty Pine Box. And you can see that uh, knots have been laminated in. The box is also made in the shape of a trapezoid. It's about so big. So, of course, the imitation, which is usually cheap from the real thing, is much more complicated here and much more difficult to make, which is interesting in itself. The craftsmanship of the making of the piece is, in a certain sense, the subject of the piece. I mean, is he really interested in a knotty pine box? The neurosis of laminating those knots in, to me, turns the whole structure into a Pandora's box of human neurosis. So if you open this thing up, we're going to have, you know, we're all going to want our mate and our breakfast cereal and you know, all the different kind of ticks that we have. I, I think it's an incredibly mysterious and powerful piece. And um, <coughs> then I wanted to go to Degas, and David said in his introduction, this thing about that I had talked about, that if a sculpture can move you physically, it will move you mentally. And this is a, uh, The Bather by Degas. And um, I, I think it's an extraordinary piece. And one of the extraordinary things I think about it is its scale and the fact that it's, you're not confronting sculpture like this. It's below your eye level. You bend over to look at it. And it takes your body, is that the subject? And you're looking down at the ground. And it brings spatially and emotionally an incredible intimacy to the piece that wouldn't be there if the piece was full scale. The bending down and looking into the water and into this beautiful base with the swirls, then the reflection of those at another level in the water of the pan. It was like a lady in a frying pan a little bit, right? But it brings you in this very beautiful abstract way down in and around and you flow like, wa like the water itself between her legs and arms and just the exact precision and decisions of how her hair leaves the tub, the pan, to her foot, to the stretch, to the pull, to the different levels this way. But my point is, is the subject of the piece really a lady and taking a bath? If it was, perhaps it would have been better to make it full scale. But I think it is, it is intimacy itself in a way that you turn, you look, you.
This is a sculpture installation that um, a student of mine made, and I think he, I don't know where he is, he may, he, he's long gone, but I didn't show a photograph of it because I didn't have one, so I made a quick sketch to talk about it. And um, what it was, it was his MFA thesis show, and he, through a trick, he got someone to give them, he didn't kill it, their dead dog, and he had a taxidermist, a dead pug, skin it, and he made like a bear rug out of the real dog. The dog had died a natural death. And he said that to the lady it was like for research or something. And so he had this dog pug rug. He had a fountain that he put blood in. And so it was flowing with blood. Right? And then he took all the elements to make methadrine, and he made a, like a bump speed bump on the floor. And he felt that this was the cat's pajamas, basically, that this was the most radical thing that anybody could possibly do. And it was incredibly provocative, and he was, you know, and other, his peers were all like, wow, you know, blood. <laughs> and I thought what was really interesting about it And it struck me, and I thought about it for a long time, wasn't any of the elements, wasn't the dog, wasn't, but you could only put three in a room. You couldn't put the dog on top of the speed pile or the fountain on the dog's tail. Say, no, no, I want you to think of these as three separate things. You couldn't line them all up. You couldn't put five more crazy things in the room. You know? You could only put three. And where did that come from? And I started thinking about the geometry of viewing and trying to locate where the artfulness, where is the art here? What was art like before Donald Judd? How many Giacometti's can you put in a room? All right. With Donald Judd, you can put three or four things in a room. You don't put things all in a row like this. You don't pile them up. Something's closer, something's unclose. Is Judd really about boxes? Or is he about a kind of geometry of viewing? It's just something that I started thinking about. Is the subject of Judd really geometrical? What our relationship to the objects are? How we're going to look at them? Did he bring a kind of shift, a structural shift, to geometry, to the geometry of viewing that then leaked out and spread? You would think, hopefully, that Dwayne Hansen and Judd were really different artists. But in terms of installation, they're identical. You can put three or four in a room. You spread them out. You don't put them too close to each other. You don't put them all in a row. You don't pile them all up on top of each other. And it wasn't too long in the past that you did. Both artists make you feel self-conscious when you look at the work. You know, he was considered very photorealistic at the time. Judd, when you look at this box in the day, you would go in and you didn't want to look like an idiot. You know, your father might say, what the fuck is that box doing? That's not art. But you would come in as a young man and go, interesting. You know, it would be, you know, you would get so close to it, you'd move, but the experience of a Hansen is almost identical. Both artists think they're good craftsmen. They're not. Look at a Dwayne Hansen today. They're not photorealistic at all. They're kind of stiff and, you know, uh, you look at Judd, you can see, you know, where things don't quite fit 100%. Here is a show from the Whitechapel New Generation British Sculpture from about 64, 62 maybe. And I put it in not to talk about the sculpture, but to talk about the geometry of viewing. And the people are obviously quite comfortable 
looking at the work in that kind of situation. So I have a sort of feeling that it's an interesting question when you look at work and think of its subject, what's it about, to ask, where's the art? What's the art part? Is it the box? Is it the people having uh, sex in the back of the Dodge? Or is it where you are in relationship to it? The world and society will let you do a lot of things. You know, we can cover ourselves, dress however we want, um, we can change our sex, we can, you know, people even trying to change their race, uh, we can become drug addicts, we can, you know, and wear a beret and be artistic, and, you know, Obama will even have you into the office for that. But if you screw around with geometry, you'll be tarred and feathered and run out of town. So, is the subject really the upper, lower, middle class lady in the dress with the dirty shoes, or is it your relationship to it in the room? I bring Copernicus into view because he's somebody who messed around with geometry. Right? His book on revolutions about what circles what, that the sun doesn't circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun. The word revolution today of sexual revolution, communist revolution, revolution comes from the title of the book. It was such an upsetting idea that this title of the book, which meaning much more literal on revolutions, becomes so unsettling that we are not the center. But just it's but my point is it's a geometrical idea. And it was so unsettling that it took five hundred years until finally, with post structuralist theory, that the world is a construct and we're the center again. That's from the, uh, the Hubble and of galaxies. And it's a very modern idea, this thing, of, of, and the struggle with, with geometry. And I want to, this is a painting at the Getty by Ballantyne called The Adulteress. And I find it extremely modern and, again, interesting to try to discover or think about what the subject of this work might be. And where the center is. So, what's happening is, you know, the biblical story. They, the Pharisees have caught the adulteress, and they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to say, you know, should we stone her? You know, that's the law, or let her go. If he says let her go, then he's not following which Pharisees were very much Jewish law of stoner. The law in, is very important. You have to follow it. If he says, let her go, he's not doing that. If he says stoner, he's a hypocrite because he's 
going against what he's preached. So what he's doing in the biblical story is we don't know what he was writing, but he picked up a stick and was writing in the sand, in the dirt, in front of this group. And it is assumed, but not said in the Bible, that he's writing everybody's sins. And I think what's fascinating about painting structurally and subjectively is how, in a very modern way, he deals, Valentine deals with the frame because the, the stick ends up out here on the floor in front of us. And it creates you, which is that is me in the picture because I had my wife take a picture of me in front of it, become part of the structure of the work. It's all of a sudden, this painting isn't a window. The boundary between the art and the viewer becomes linked. You become implicated within to, into the work. You become part of the group. And by implications, your sins are being written on the floor itself. And I find that I showed it after the stars of the Hubble, because I find it a very, very modern idea in terms of structure and viewing art and subject. And a piece very similar to that is Vito Acconci's Seedbed. And I'll show some other slides of it in a minute, but Acconci's Under the Ramp. So he builds a plywood floor, raises it three feet in the gallery, and he hangs microphones under the ramp. And the speaker is with the mics are hooked to, and he's under there. And he's masturbating while he's having fantasies about the people walking on the ramp. So he'll say things like in the live flow of the sculpture, the person on the left, I'm stroking your hair, I got my hand on your breast, blah, blah, blah until he has, uh, until he comes. The piece initiated before he got the idea to masturbate. It, it, it came, in a sense, with the title Seedbed, and he was thinking he was trying to make a work that was foundational to the experience of art, to art itself. Like, how could he not be a mediator, so like an artist would have something to express, paint a painting, and the artist's experience would be mediated through the painting, all right? So you would have it second. He wanted to take you and bring you primarily into the structure of the piece, and I think identically, identically to Valentine's work. If you can forget that the subject's masturbation and the subject's Jesus is writing, you know, the biblical story, if you can accept that those aren't the true subject and look like Copernicus did at geometry and a larger structure, then you find, I think, something really interesting happens. You know, when I was a young kid and Akanchi would come to the university to talk or something, people would go, oh, don't shake his hand, <laughs> you know. But it's a, it's a, Fascinating, uh, there, there is Mr. Conchi under the ramp. And uh, and how did he get here? I mean, how did this come about? And with this, Conchi started as a poet. And he started as a concrete poet. And when I say concrete poet, most of us think about those poems from the 50s about nuclear destruction, they'd be written in the shape of a bomb. Right? That wasn't real concrete poetry. Um, and my friend Jack Bankowski is here, and he uh, helps me with poetry. And he's going to read an Akanchi poem that I brought in, very short. And then we'll, do you mind? And we'll, then we'll take it from there.
knew I was going to do this an hour ago when I was just the last sentence. You should always bring your poetry consultant because you don't know when you'll need them. <laughs> read this word, then read this word. Read this word next. Read this word now. See one word. See one word next. See one word now, and then see one word again. Look at three words here. Look at three words now. Look at three words now to take in five words again. Take in five words, so take in five words. Do it now. See these words at a glance. See these words at this glance. At this glance, hold this line in view. Hold this line in another view. And in a third view, spot seven lines at once. Then twice, then thrice, then a fourth time, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth. Thank you. So, one thing I share with Vito Acconci is um, uh, we both went to the University of Iowa. I went to a, the art program 10 years after he was at the Writers' Workshop. And he began as a poet, and uh, a concrete poet. And I think from Jack's page, I think that's a really beautiful poem. And thanks, Jack, for reading it a lot. Um, I think it was nice to put it in another voice to give everyone a break, too. But <laughs> he thought a lot about the page and could write only like on this page, in this corner, this word, as you can see from Jack's reading, that it was very referred to the page. He said that he was very influenced by Jasper Johns as a poet. Jasper Johns could not paint a picture of a tree, but he could paint a flag or a target because it already existed. Right? Akanchi couldn't write a poem about his girlfriend, but he could write a poem about the words on a page in front of him. And Johns could paint a map because it existed already two-dimensionally. So I find it kind of fascinating with this kind of corner Akanchi got into. There's another one of his poems. And, at a, and here's the one Jack read. At a certain point, it was so limiting for him that not as an artist, but as a poet, he left the page. He thought of the page as a field. And he left the field of the page and entered social space. And this was one of his very first pieces as a poet entering social space, and it was called Follow, and um, following piece. And he would choose a person on the street and follow them until they went into a private space. And when I saw this, I was very young, and I said, that's not art. What is, you know, how could that, you know, possibly be art? But I think it's fascinating then in relationship to, to then a work like Seedbed doesn't just come out of the blue, in a sense. But its structure is very deep in somebody's thinking and progression as an artist. There's another Hanson I wanted to show. <clears throat> and, and I wanted to show it after the social space of Akanchi's piece, which I think is both structural, like a concrete poem, yet as subject to, like when I was young, looking at it, saying, that's not art. You know, that can't be art. And it, it engaged me in this very peculiar social way. And this piece of Hansen's, it's an early Hansen piece, probably from about the same time. And I think it engages probably at about level 0.01. And why? I, I think it's outside. I'd rather see a photograph of the race riot than the sculpture of it. That nothing happens that you don't know already. There is like a ship in a bottle is a pictorial experience because you don't need to walk around the back of it. You only need to stand in front of it and look at it. Structurally, you know it's about the feet of its in construction. And this, 
I think there is no need to really investigate it or to bring it home and think about it. But when he brings at a certain point the work inside, structurally I think something happens and something becomes geometrically turned inside out in a sense to the white cube he brings the outside no matter what one thinks of Hansen if it's good or not I, 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 my point I'm trying to get is the subject isn't the drug addict that might not change looking at the sculpture what you think of you know legalizing drugs or not legalizing drugs or you know it doesn't really comment on it but what it does it comments more on the inside and the outside and what we expect within the white cube in a sense the kids are fascinated in a macabre kind of way right I asked his family two days ago, or had my assistant, why the one had the beard and the other didn't. And it's the same sculpture. And they said, it, which it was kind of a nice answer because sometimes he would think it looked better the other way and it changed them. This is from the same era, and uh, Don Andrea, Andrea. John DeAndrea. He was, in a sense, Hansen's counterpoint. Maybe he had more technical ability, even in the sense that his sculptures could be naked where Hansen's never could. But your relationship to it, the basis, it becomes like this particular piece is interesting because it's just like being in a figure drawing class. Nothing structurally is altered in your relationship to the aesthetic experience other than what he can do and the aesthetics, quote unquote, of looking at a naked lady per se. Though it's not overly pornographic or overly, you know, it, it is um, provocative in that way. Because you can look at her because she's not alive. You see, I think, and I may be obviously projecting because I'm not in this room, but socially it doesn't really change the fact that a lot of these guys are going to read Playboy on the way home on the train. You know, the experience is somewhat voyeuristic and somewhat similar. Not to say I don't really like John Andrea, I do. But it's the same era, Mary Quant. This is about 62. And I wanted to show this because I began my sculpture career looking at high modernism and Anthony Caro, which was Michael Fried wrote about him often as um, totally abstract, you know, this whole art and objecthood essay and that. But is there a subject to that abstraction? And when you look at a Caro from that era, I think they're quite beautiful. And they're very abstract, but they're also very pop. And like the picture, the ad of the miniskirts I showed before, it's 1962 and there's a knock on the door. And you open it and there's a lady in a green vinyl miniskirt saying, I got pop. And it has a quality, I think, that is born of that moment. I mean, I think they're beautiful pieces, but I think they cannot be separated from 1962. And if you look at a piece like Early One Morning, 
It's incredibly hallucinogenic. This piece technically barely stands. It's so extended structurally. And it has a quality of disjuncture, meaning a radically different viewing as you walk around it. And you get around to one side of it, all of space flattens out. What does that do? It's like space clings to it like clay to an armature, and the whole room becomes a spatial accordion. When you're walking, you know, the room itself collapses and expands and collapses and expands, not unlike a hallucinogenic experience. The Beatles in 62 aren't even singing, I want to hold your hand. You know, and Carl isn't taking LSD, but somehow I think he's so in tune to a time and to a moment that these works structurally are born in that split second. And that subject, that cultural subject, can't be divorced from them, though it might drift away from them. He's been talked about as abstract sculptures, but a kinesthetics of the body freed from the body. So you couldn't understand a Carl sculpture without having a body. If you were born on the moon, you wouldn't be able to look at a Carl work. Right? So these were the earlier pieces, and that's called Man Tying His Shoe, and everything's in his way, the need, but you know, the, the kinesthetics of the muscles. This lady can barely get up. Man taking off his sweater. Right? So like the idea is that Carl liberated these kinesthetic notions of the figure and the body from the body, spread them out below eye level like the Gauss piece that you looked, at, looked down on, and they become for the first works ever totally and completely abstract. I think in a work like Midday you see that in a sense, that relationship to the figure again. I want to go back to John DeAndrea for a second. And I think it's a beautiful piece, this piece. And again, because it's a sculpture and she's not alive, you can track it, you can look at her, you can move around it, you can become a kind of voyeur. Um, what it changes in you is again probably very little in your relationship to what maybe a young man or a young person could check out anatomy in a, in a, in a, in a way. Oops, I went too fast. But I put this in here not to cheat, but because I want it and to, you look at this, what I'm trying to say, when I showed you those carls, you're on the outside, but you wouldn't understand them without a body, right? This, you know, there's a kinesthetics that comes in the subject. This piece, again, it's not trying to put it down because I, I really like it, but you view it totally from the outside. You know, like it's not a per, it's like looking at a Playboy in a certain sense, but I wanted to bring this one up. It's the last piece I'm going to show, but I wanted you to bear with me for a minute because I wanted to do some close looking at, at this sculpture. And this is at the Met, and it's in the American wing, 19th century. You know, you've all been through it. There's a cafeteria at one end, and you kind of just hurry through it. It's got this like crappy marble sculptures from the 19th century that Americans did that just, you know, you pass by as quickly as possible. And I did for years. And then one day I saw, um, Hiawatha by um, Gaudens, St. Gaudens. And I just was, it was given recently. It had never been in that room before, and I was just drawn to it. And I started looking at that sculpture, and then slowly looking at some other work. And this is a, called Fragilina, and it's by, uh, my pronunciation is really bad, but um, Perellini, 
Perlini. But you could go there and read the name and do better than I, I, I got the spelling of it. But at first view, and we walked by it and I walked by it because to me it was an idealized woman nude from the 19th century. And I, you know, I had for years just nothing to do with it, just stormed on by it. I thought it was kind of pathetic. And then I started giving it some time and I still didn't like it. I thought it was this idealized figure of a, of a woman and I was hopefully getting beyond that. She torques a little, but she's out of focus. And I did a little research and the artist wrote that, oh, I made her out of focus because everybody has a different idealism of a human figure of a woman. And so I made her out of focus so you could project your own idealism on it. But I think something else really interesting slowly happens, or slowly happened to me. As I looked at this figure and got past the gesture and the <coughs> idealism, and I was drawn, of course, to the focus quality of the marble, and I was drawn in There's very little space, I think no space between things. Like I talked about a loom girl, I thought the most realistic part of the sculpture was the very real space between her hand and the thigh, and then between the arm and the body. There's some here, but for instance here, there's none. And that drew me into those lines, into those junctures where like the hand reaches the neck and what that what happens from the nipple up the breast to underneath the chin, where it's filled. And the legs, what the quality of the marble is between the legs and the fill to different areas where it's more realistic. What the relationship between the figure to its marble base is. And I didn't know if it was any good or interesting, but I was drawn, kept coming back, and kind of fascinated by this. Look what happens here, and the kind of stop and go quality along the line of the leg to where there's almost under, there's no undercut, little undercut, no undercut, some undercut. And then you move back to this beautiful area where the toes emerge into the marble itself. And then where in between the toes is left like really dry. This really beautiful detail here where the juncture between the big toe and the base is so raw and then it kind of like spills up out of focus to the, you know, the bulbliness of the big toe there where the nail is buried. And to what effect is it? What happens with the finger to the chin in between the fingers? And there's a curl to the toes. And I started thinking, this is like a sculpture for a blind person. There's no detail, but there's these strange kind of abstract forms. You can't, the hair is not there. What happens with the fingers? And look where the fingers on the chin. And eventually, I think that's a very beautiful area. The fill there is actually abstraction of the hair. So unlike the John de Andrea, which is all from the outside, the sculpture, the more 
I went into this out of focus quality, into these junctures of places where arms were touching and what was happening between. I found myself all of a sudden, one day, inside the sculpture. Living in the sculpture, what was important about it. And it wasn't like Caro's kinesthetics of the arms, you know, man taking off his shirt. But you feel it, but you feel it from the outside, from memory, from body memory. There was no feeling because, again, I'm not a woman, and it wasn't about a transcendent experience of becoming a woman. It was about being somehow inside this body. And that's the nature, or the end and the nature of uh, my thoughts on, on uh, sculpture and subject at the moment. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if, if you have any. Yes. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, you had mentioned uh, your modernist training and the work that came, I guess, professionally afterwards. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you took from that and brought to your, your professional work. I mean, I'm assuming that there were maybe like formal techniques that carried over. Maybe not so much techniques, but um, because I've never been very good at techniques. Even when I was a young student, I would trick the graduate students into welding and cutting things for me. Because I have a, you know, I, I, you know, I can kind of think things out and move things around, but didn't have a lot of the uh, uh, skill. Um, so it wasn't so much techniques, but I think uh, uh, thinking sculpturally rather than about sculpture. And I was, part of this training was that the finished pieces weren't important. And I was kind of scolded early on for welding them and painting them red, because that was a way to tell the world that they were finished. And that um, better to just move on, cannibalize them, cut them back up, and put them in the scrap heap. And the sculptures were more like punctuation marks in a behavior, you know, in, a, in a way of getting somewhere and thinking about the world. And I think that, that was, you know, then I, I, I still feel that I haven't left that background. I, I, I don't see a divide, like, you know, from, because I'm an artist, I don't have to. So, you know, from modernism to ancient to renaissance to different areas, an artist doesn't have to, you know, we're not scholars, so we don't have to draw the distinctions and find the relationships you can just sort of pull and you know, find the um, value and the very real contemporaryness in you know, sculptural relationships. One other thing really quick. Um, in, the, in your first piece that you showed, your piece with the small figure, um, I was thinking about um, your other lecture where you talked about the, the whole, the eyes and the, the space of the eyes in, I believe, is a Rodin sculpture. Yeah. Is, is there any relationship between that and, the, and the, the almost emptiness of the eyes in, the, in that first slide? No, I've always kept the eyes empty because it hurts, I think, to put a hole in them. You know, to, to me it's just like, uh, you know, and the form, it's just more, sculpturally the surface. It, it's not like a Renaissance Bernini indentation there to break the light up. I, I just, it hurts me when I think about it. And um, so that, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't put it in. But, I, you know, I didn't, I put this lecture together with some thought. And this 19th century piece where I said you enter, I mean, obviously that wasn't the artist's intent, you know. I think that happens for me now you know, in, in, in looking at it. And I think a very different thing happens. It's, it's, I'm not talking about that as an ideal, as a place to go. I think a very different thing, I don't think you can enter a loon girl. You can enter this piece, I can enter this piece. I can't, and I made it, I can't enter a loon girl. I'm repulsed by it, and bounce, I bounce off of it. 
and, and it's, it's like a Carl, to me, it's like a Carl sculpture. It's a relationship of parts on a manifold that are, you know, sort of self-sustaining within the sculpture itself, itself that, I mean, in that way, I, I think it's, it's very traditional in terms of high modernism. Yes. Hi, as a former uh, writer in Houston, been here for 30 years, um, it's so great to be part of, have you come here and be part of the tradition of our intellectual community. I just want to ask you, you mentioned a uh, counterpoint of Oldenburg and I'm not sure of the other artists you mentioned, but where do you see yourself or do you have an idea of yourself, who your counterpoint or counterpoint might be of your generation? Are you aware of that yet or do you think, I know it's not really your job, but do you have any thoughts about that? You, your work in relation to maybe your peers from Iowa or people, you know, classmates or things like that? Well, I don't really have any classmates. And I, just I mean, had living artists that came up with you and your generation, you know, or just yeah, no, I, 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 your place in time right now. Yeah, or, I, I know mean, it's a crazy question. It's easy for me to talk about counterpoint when it's other people's work, in, in a way, when I can go back and talk about Oldenburg and Keenholz. And I really like those Keenholz pieces. And, and I could approach them in another lecture in a totally different way, you know, in terms of subject and geometry of viewing, I approach them this, this way. Um, I, I guess I would say that uh, Michael Fried's writing and ideas about Kara are a counterpoint to, to, to me. Because I, I think of a denial of subject in a way. Not sure. I'm being really clear about that, but or a dynamic of. of, of I, I think Carl does have a subject, and I think it becomes all too clear later when the subject leaves, in a sense, the moment, and becomes about sculpture. So after the '60s, you know, the people start to criticize and see the painted surface as a skin that is unnecessary. And they remove, he removes the pain. A lot of new generation sculptors follow him because he's the guru in, in a way. And then he starts building with steel volumes and almost working more and more to a love of sculpture and about sculpture and trying different things. You know? But it, it loses subject in a way, which I think the subject of a Carl from 62 is very elusive, but I think it's very strong. So I would say that was a counterpoint for me. Yeah. I've got pot. Well, Carl is like, I think those pieces are incredibly hallucinogenic. The one source, I think that's called source, all right? And so it's got the wire scrim, it's got the metal, it's got the bar, and then it's got the one bars on the floor, and another is welded. You see the welds, you understand the welds, but you foil the welds. The piece still floats apart. It still breaks apart, all right? It's a hallucinogenic kind of, um, you know, experience that I think comes from that cultural moment in both time and space. And um, so when I say, I'm not trying, I'm being funny a little bit, but also not, that I think that, car, I, I think any great art has to be born, not in the future or in the past, but alive and kicking in its split second cultural moment. And I, that I, in, in a, that's a heavy handed way of saying, you know, between, 1960 and 1968, Carl's boom there in London. You know, a lot, and I think the work transcends all that. You know, it's, it's I, I, where I think, in a sense, you can see the moment Keenholz is born into, but you know, 
all that squabble about backseat dodge, you know, it goes, you know, it's not alive. Um, there's a temporal passage in Cara with the paint, you know, so you see it like at the modern, when they put the uh, recent pieces on the roof, they repainted, for instance, midday, and they painted it much more lemon yellow than the kind of caterpillar yellow that it was at the modern. And Carl agreed with it. He just didn't see, you know, but it loses its temporal embedment, you know, and I can't, it, it sort of brings like early one morning accordion space. I think an accordion space and time in a way. And you, it's hard, if I talk too much about it, it becomes literal and Carl is anything but literal. But the problem with that lemon, excuse me, lemon yellow was it's a designer color from today. You know, and this is another form with these bridge pieces, this thing, this relationship to the figure, to kinesthetics, to hallucination. I, you know, the only people hallucinating today, you know, we're putting them in jail, and I kind of agree. You know, they're, they shouldn't be, you know, that moment of hallucinogenics is past, in a sense, you know, so kids doing it today is a different deal. I don't mean to be reactionary or something, but so painting Carl's midday a lemon yellow is like the opposite. You know, it just, you know, it's today from a structure. It's, it's missing a chunk of its structure, which is the color of that moment, that it somehow beautifully carries forth, kicking in a way, you know, in a, in, but that's what I mean. So I'm, I'm being a little bit heavy handed by the example. Yeah. Well, they're precise aesthetically, because he would throw them back to fabricators, you know, and change them. He'd look at them and change them by a quarter of an inch or three, you know, you know, a thirty-second of an inch, and you know, bring them forward and back. But the actual craftsmanship, which I think he feels he had, you know, that, that they're, they're not so precise, that things don't fit together as precisely as he would like you to think they fit together. At close inspection, there is a distance that stops working, and that's what I meant as sort of the same, it's a minor point, but it's the same with a Hansen. There's a point where a Hansen is just oil paint and fiberglass, you know, so, uh, you know, it's really interesting to look at some art, um, the Valentine painting, as you get close and closer and closer and closer, it doesn't disintegrate. There isn't a point where it doesn't work anymore. Same with people, as you get closer, you know, unless you're married or have a shallow friend or something, that, you know, the lies break down, you know, before dinner or something. I mean, everything has an artifice, but hopefully it lasts until midnight or you know, like that's what the pumpkin story is about, right? With Cinderella, you know, where it doesn't fall apart until midnight. Um, no, I, I really, Judd's work is great, I really like it, but it doesn't survive close viewing in a certain, and neither does Hanson's. De Andreas does much better. But, you know, like when you get close to a Valentine painting, you see the philosophy is in the painting, you know? It's in the blood of the hand, that one gentleman's face when he's turning around, looking down at the sins. Look, it, it's in the painting, you know, it's in the structure, it's not in the story about the structure. It's in the art. I have a story, I'll say it really fast, that I used to tell students that a um, drug lord through an agent contacted me years ago, wanted me to make a sculpture privately that would take some aspect, some deep aspect of my soul and bring it up and out. And I was met in New York, I agreed to do it, the identity of the person was kept secret, I didn't know it. And I thought for months and months, what kind of sculpture could I make that would bring myself, my soul up? And I had friends then that were in the illicit drug trade, I also had some friends who were paramedics. So one night, my assistant stayed late, they put me on the work table, and my drug dealing friends injected me with an overdose of heroin and barbiturates. I was all hooked up to the paramedics machine, 
and they gave my assistants exactly three minutes and 44 seconds to take a death mask. They weren't quite done, hadn't quite set. They said, away from the body, away from the body, and they hit me with the paddles. And I came awake and they pulled the mask off. So it was a death mask of myself. And so we cratered it up, I gave it to the agent. Three months later, a check, a substantial amount of money came. I heard from the agent that he was happy with it. I never knew what happened after that. <laughs> so the art is not, I mean, what I made is just a crappy old death mask. You know, 19th century is full of them. They're all over, you know? I mean, people, you know, I think Kiki made one of her dad. If you look at the thing, oh yeah, great. You know, it's just this like old thing laying around, you know? The art is in the story. The meaning is in the story. It's not in the sculpture. And this whole talk and all these talks have been about trying to find where does the art exist? Does it exist in the discussion around it or does it exist in the object itself? And so at close viewing, you know, I think the jug, the art exists in the geometry and how we look at them, how you can place them in a room. That's why I bring up the Hanson, because they're, you know, you know, they make you feel uncomfortable. You know, who wants to look at this, you know, figure, uh, look at a box, you know, three are in a room. The, the you know, the, the Ballantine painting, it's in the struck, in a conchi, really hits the point home. You know, when he gets himself off the page, following people, but then seedbed. You know, the art, you, yourself, your persona, is in the structure, of the very structure of the art. You know, it's in that here and now moment of the experience of your manipulated, in a sense, into the structure of what is artful about the piece. So it's a struggle. I think that answers some of the other questions too, in a way, about the high modernists and Caro and that. You know, I think in '62 to '67, you can find the artfulness in the Caro, in the embedment in space. In the '70s and '80s, you find it in the genre of sculpture. Oh wow, beautiful! Look at that form. The death, that's you know, you 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 find it out else, elsewhere. And it's, it's a relationship to the, to the medium itself. And the struggle for any artist is to put it, put the art part, sounds really silly, but there is an art part because what we think the art is about goes away. It's the first thing, I have said this before, that the fire hose of time just blasts away what we think it's about. We have no idea what the votive reason for a Kiros figure is but we can look at it and feel its contemporaneous because of the art part. You know, so I guess that's what I'm trying to say. In this subject matter as a formal element, that whatever the subject matter is, we're gonna get confused and forget it. You know? Same as critical control just floats away. And you're left with this thing. And either they're gonna sweep it away or they're gonna have a relationship with it you know, in time, people.